Let's uh, go ahead and take our Bibles, Romans 12, and let's do what Taylor said. Let's jump right in and examine further what God would teach us about spiritual gifts. That is an area, of course, that he's over, that he sovereignly um, controls. It's the distribution of spiritual gifts according to his grace and by a measure of faith. And we've been in this passage for five weeks now. We're going to wrap it up today. And we've been approaching this passage from three angles, all right? One overarching five-week big idea that God's uh, common good manifestations, they come from inside-out transformation, and that's possible because of God's mercy-rich salvation. That's really the one-sentence summary of Romans 12, 1 through 8. Uh, going along with this were three complementary couplets of words that kind of help us understand how the gifts operate. Here's those words for us. Uh, sobriety with humility, verse 3. Unity with variety, verses 4 and 5. And then the gifts listed in 6 through 8 show us that there's functionality with profitability. These are very similar to last year's words that we saw in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. And so we're seeing consistent themes kind of, again, emerge about this topic of spiritual gifts. And this week we're going to see the seven, uh, well, the last two weeks we've seen the seven grace gifts. I'll repeat them for you briefly. It's prophecy. This is the ones mentioned here at least. Prophecy, service, teaching, then exhortation, giving, leadership, and acts of mercy. We're going to look at the last four today and see what God will show us about these four and then make some final application for the whole series, okay? So let's jump right in, can we? Let's read again verses 6 through 8 of Romans 12 where these seven grace gifts are listed. The Bible says in verse 6, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And there again, there's this functionality with profitability. There are different gifts. They're body-wide, and yet we should employ them and use them. And so as each person uses his different gift, the body as a whole profits. Here's seven they list in this passage. He says, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, and the one who teaches in his teaching. We covered those last week. Here's the four for this week. The one who exhorts in his exhortation. The one who contributes in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. And the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let's so dive into the first gift listed in verse 8. The idea of exhortation. Exhortation, you could be called the gift of encouragement as well. It's simply this divine enablement um, to, to come alongside someone with with truth that encourages, it, it, it supports, it strengthens, it comforts. We draw this really from the, the root meaning of the word, and it's, uh, it means to come alongside. If you took the word and kind of dissected it, it's etymology, it just means to come alongside someone. And so the gift of exhortation or encouragement is when by the Holy Spirit's power you come alongside side someone and you're just helping them take next steps. You're prodding them. You're right beside them. I think some of the best insight into what this word means and how this gift looks is when you understand that this is one of the titles given to the Holy Spirit. In fact, this very word, exhortations, parakletos, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. Of course, in, in his role as a third person of the Trinity, he's inside of us. He dwells in us. He's the seal of our salvation. But I think you get the analogy. He's the one that comes alongside of us. And Jesus told his disciples, he will guide you into all truth. He'll be your comforter. So do you get the picture of the exhorter, the comforter, the Holy Spirit walking alongside of us? So when the gift of exhortation is in play, it's that person empowered by the Holy Spirit who just kind of shoulders up with you. They're side by side, their arm on their length with you and, and they're prodding you, don't quit. You're discouraged, you're downtrodden, you're kind of maybe, you know, low at the time, but they're just going to link up with you, encourage you. They're going to put courage in you, so to speak, strengthen you, comfort you. Here's the next step. Let's do this now. Let's do that now. It's a spiritual gift of exhortation. A good example is the New Testament person of Barnabas, who, by the way, his nickname was the son of encouragement. Do you know Barnabas' name was actually Joseph? In Acts 5, excuse me, Acts 4, 36, we see that. He's called Joseph. Then it says, but he's also called the uh, son of encouragement, Barnabas. So we've come to know him as Barnabas, but his name was actually Joseph. 
He's the son of encouragement. And we find that he did this very much in the scriptures, especially to two people. He was one of the apostle Paul's very first friends when he was first known as Saul. You know, Saul came back to Jerusalem and he had been the murderer, the capture of the church and the Christians, but now he's been converted. And so he's back in Jerusalem and everyone's like, ah, this is a, this is a play. <laughs> They're skeptic, skeptical, right? And yet Barnabas is kind of side by side with Saul saying, guys, he's genuinely converted. He was one of Saul's first friends. He was also one of John Mark's continuing longtime friends. So Barnabas ended up being a missionary partner with Saul, who then became Paul. And at some point in their missionary journeys, Paul had had it with John Mark. He's like, you know what? This guy seems to be a quitter. He's not really hanging in there. I'm done with him. He can't go on the trips. Well, Barnabas felt like that was a bad call. And so in Acts uh, 16, Paul and Barnabas split up and Barnabas stays with John Mark. The text in Acts seems to indicate that the church agreed with Paul, by the way. However, you get to 1 Timothy, Paul's asking for John Mark. And I often think, where would John Mark have been if Barnabas had not gone with him and kind of linked up with him side by side and encouraged him in what was a very difficult moment? So Barnabas is one of those encouragers. I think he showed this spiritual gift. Here's the second gift listed. It's the gift of giving. And by the way, the example of the gift of giving is also Barnabas. This is quite a dude, okay? I'm just telling you. In Acts chapter four, he's listed. In Acts, I think it's what, nine and 10 and 11, we see him mentioned as, Paul, as Saul's friend. But one of the first things said about Barnabas is that he's the one who sold some land and brought the proceeds of the land and laid it to the apostles' feet. In other words, gave it to the church for their ministry. This is Barnabas. And so he not only exhibited encouragement in that spiritual gift, he also was empowered by God's spirit to give in a generous, liberal way. And that's the word mentioned here, the idea of, of giving, contributing is what the text actually says. Um, this is the word, means to, it means to take part of something, to share in something. And so you're just liberally, generously giving and you're contributing to a, to a need, to a, to a situation, much like Barnabas did in helping the first church there in Jerusalem. It says here that this person who is operating with this gift should contribute in generosity. Do you notice the fire there? In other words, the word there is, is liberally, but it also has this sense of not just generously, but also this sense of, of simply. In other words, they don't make giving complicated. They don't need a lot of hoopla. They don't need fanfare and they don't need to have a lot of hoops to jump through. They're not trying necessarily to get a tax credit. They're not trying to, you know, squeeze someone over here. They just simply see an opportunity and they feel generous and they say, I'll help out. And it's real simple to them. It's very focused. And so they're just generous and liberal, open-handed. This is how they give. And so these first two gifts mentioned here, exhortation, the idea of giving, we see them really playing out in the life of Barnabas well. The third gift in our list here is the idea of leading. And it says here, this gift of leadership should be done with zeal. Leadership here is the word for ruling. It means to set before, to stand before. It's used a lot in the scriptures in regards to elders. In fact, this same word, the idea of leading here in Romans 12 is used in 1 Thessalonians chapter five when it says this, listen to this verse. We beseech you, brothers, to know those which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. The words over you in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 is the same word used in Romans 12, 8 when it says leading. And so leading and ruling, you mean over someone is kind of the idea here. It means to set before, to stand before people and to mobilize them, uh, to kind of motivate them, to help them accomplish uh, things harmoniously and that are in line with God's purposes. Same words used in 1 Timothy 3 and 1 Timothy 5 in regards to elders again. So I think one of the best examples of this gift is elders in the scripture, especially Peter and James, perhaps. They were both elders at Jerusalem, those, that first church, they were pastors there. In this uh, text, it says that those who lead with this gift, they should lead with uh, zeal. I like that word, don't you? It, it means earnestness. It has a uh, connotation of haste, like let's get after it, you know? So that's what's happening here is they're saying that if, if God's gifting you with leadership to mobilize people harmoniously for his purposes, man, then really chase after that, be earnest about it, be zealous, be diligent, make haste in that. I think this is uh, 
One of the reasons I like Peter and James as examples of this. You recall Peter at Pentecost, he was hustling it, wasn't it? To, to get to preach it, and he saw God's spirit fall, and he saw the nations there, and he said, man, what an opportune time to make sure that people know that the one that you crucified, he's risen, he's Jesus, Lord. And he preached that quickly and fervently. Uh, so I think Peter was a good example of this gift. It may be why when he wrote 1 Peter in chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, Peter says that to the elders among you, I want to encourage you to shepherd willingly, not compulsively, but to lead the flock and to feed the flock. And he kind of lays out this real uh, earnest, willing um, picture of an elder, someone who's leading the church, harmoniously mobilizing people for God's purposes. I also like James for this because James um, is kind of a silent pastor in the first church. But when you get to Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council's meeting, and their main goal is to answer questions the Gentiles have about the gospel of grace as well as the Jews. And so there's this kind of rift between Jews and Gentiles in the early church. And get this, if you read Acts 15, the list of speakers is, is incredible. It's, it's Paul, Barnabas, and Peter. That's, that's a lineup, guys. Let's just be honest, okay? So they're all speaking to Jews and Gentiles, trying to bring them together. But you know who it actually was that harmoniously, I think, bridged the gap in a beautiful way? It was James. Read Acts 15. James seems to be the last speaker who kind of ties the, the package all together and says, hey, here's what, here's what God's saying, and here's what we should do. And he kind of lays it out for him. So James, Peter, examples of, of this gift of leadership in the New Testament. And then the final gift here is the gift of acts of mercy. It simply means that we're divinely empowered and able to cheerfully and practically help those who are suffering. Uh, it's compassion moved to action. In other words, mercy is what we express when we know that God is leading Sympathy. You're not just feeling something, you're actually uh, displaying something. It's love in action. It's kind of a shoe leather type of compassion. Acts of mercy. Some call this just the gift of mercy. Acts of mercy, the same thing. Uh, it says in this text that this gift is to be done with uh, cheerfulness. The word there, yes, means joyfulness, but it has the idea too of readiness, of, of willingness. In other words, your eyes are focused, you're set. You've got one thing on your mind, you're going to get this done, so to speak. And so you have a willing, joyful heart. In fact, the word cheerfulness here, the root of this word is the same root from which we get our word hilarious. So people that show acts of mercy aren't like drug to the scene. They're not like watching someone who's in distress or suffering and they're like, oh, brother, I guess it's my turn. It's not, that's not how they're thinking. They're focused and cheerful and ready and willing uh, joyful to, to bring God's love in, in, a, in a real physical way to a situation where there's distress and suffering. To be frank with you, it was difficult to really locate a specific example of this in the New Testament. Uh, I have some reasons for that I won't share here except to say this. Perhaps um, there is a mixing of gifts at times, like the acts of mercy at times could wear the clothes of, of the gift of service or the gift of helps. And so it's difficult sometimes to say, was that an act of mercy? Was that a gift of service? Was that a gift of helps? We just sometimes don't know in those moments when someone's helping a suffering person or someone in distress. I do think there may be an example in the person of Dorcas, Acts 9.36. She's also known as Tabitha, but in Acts 9.36, it said she was a woman. They were there actually, I think she had passed away and they're there for a funeral. But, uh, in Acts 9.36, she was a woman who had acts of charity, the Bible says, or acts of love. Could be a reference to someone who, Holy Spirit, acts of mercy. I wonder, too, if, if a good example might not be the Good Samaritan. Now, I know it's a parable, but in the telling of that parable, I mean, did the Good Samaritan not exhibit great acts of mercy as well as a, a real gift of giving? So even in that situation, we can kind of go to that person in this parable that Christ told and think about how that might look. Let me add this one further note as we think about this gift of the, the mercy gift. I'm struck by several of these gifts today that there's a mixing and a merging going on. Like for instance, Barnabas seemed to have had the gift of giving. 
He also seems to have had the gift of encouragement, didn't he? Uh, other folks have acts of mercy. Uh, maybe they have the gift of helps as well, the gift of service. In holding the Holy Spirit. Like, you know what? I've taken the test. I have a mercy gift, and that's all I have, and that's all I'm going to do. I, I think... Um, I've heard of this uh, idea that most of us have a gift mix. I agree with that. What I really more deeply believe is that every gift's available for every believer and God's Holy Spirit gives them as he wills, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. So I would say, just be available for whatever gift God wants to give you in that moment. And you may find that there's a gift mix and a gift merging always happening in your life. So don't pigeonhole yourself or the Holy Spirit. Again, I'll repeat this like I did last year. Make availability your goal, not definability. So I've quickly given you the four gifts for today on purpose because I want to spend some time trying to make some application here. Here are the four gifts again. They're in our text, Romans 12. They're, um, make sure I get them right here. Exhortation or encouragement, giving or contributing, leadership and acts of mercy. And what I think you're wondering, and what I wonder too, is after five weeks of teaching on these eight verses, after another series this year that followed last year's series, we're going to go again next year and for the Common Good Three. Like, why, why is there so much emphasis on spiritual gifts? Why are we annually coming back to this? Because it is an important, not just topic, it's an important reality in the church. This is one of the ways God displays his power and presence. Remember, spiritual gifts... It's God going public. So we shouldn't minimize or just kind of think this doesn't matter. So every year I want to kind of revisit this for a while. And this is why it's very important that that we spend a little time now on this last week. What do I do with these five weeks of teaching? With this one big idea? With these three couplets of words? With these seven grace gifts? What do I do with this, Todd? Well, let me kind of revisit a central truth that we gave last year in our series on spiritual gifts, but I want to reword it. We said it last year like this. We said this, act first, ask later. You probably don't remember that, but maybe that nudged your memory a bit. Do you kind of, oh, I kind of recall that now. We encourage you to be more about availability than definability, to be more about action than analysis, especially in spiritual gifts. Here's how I want to word it this year. I want to to encourage you this way. Usage will enable you to move towards knowledge. In other words, if you'll commit to usage, you will discover knowledge. And I say this in reference to spiritual gifts. Oftentimes what we think is this. I'm going to examine the gifts and once I know, then I'll implement the gift. I think that's backwards. I'm not against defining. We did today. We did last week a bit. I'm not against like learning. But I think in spiritual gifts, often we, we gain the knowledge of what our gift is after we've just been available and God has used us. We look back and we assess. We say, oh, that's what was going on there. Right. Now, admittedly, we can, there can be a tandem here and I agree with that. But I think in our circles, often we've put the, the analysis first to a large degree and sometimes we just don't ever move and act until we think we know everything about it. And I just want to flip that. And I want to say to you this, commit to usage and you'll discover knowledge. And maybe you're saying, Todd, how do I do that? Here's some simple ways and they are repeat from last year. But the reason they're simple and they're repeated is because I want to reinforce a philosophy of spiritual gifts that I think is rooted in the Bible in in all the scriptural passages about spiritual gifts. Uh, Ephesians, 1 Peter, Romans, 1 Corinthians. We see these kinds of, of ideas really coming at us strongly. First of all, meet obvious needs. I, I draw your t- attention to this phrase in this text when he says, let us use them. He didn't say, let us analyze them. He said, let us, say it with me, church, use them. them. 
There's a bent toward action when it comes to spiritual gifts. Action that's really prompted by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to ask you to open, just keep your eyes wide open to needs around you all the time, whether it's when we gather, when we're scattered, Sunday, Saturday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Friday. When needs are apparent, ask this question, God, would you have me engage in that? Would you have me interact with that? Should I try to help meet that need? Should I help with this problem? Lord, should, should I get involved with that? And the minute, watch this, the minute you sense God's spirit saying, yes, this is a moment I want you to engage and interact, then just begin to do that. Now watch this, listen very carefully, because if you'll just commit to meeting obvious needs, and by the way, when I say needs, it could be a physical need, could be another kind of need with maybe a discussion or a conversation or knowledge, so needs of all types here. But when you sense and see a need and you ask God, God, do you want me to interact with that, engage with this and help? And his Holy Spirit says, yes, you can move forward for one reason. And this is probably what I believe about spiritual gifts most deeply. You can move forward, even if you're not sure of all the details, because it's the Holy Spirit of God that divinely distributes the gifts. They're not humanly selected. Grasp this church. It's not like a, a, you know, a buffet and you get to go and say, you know, I think I like the gift of uh, mercy today. Pick mercy from the counter and go home. That's not how spiritual gifts work. Spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, as he wills. And so as we just commit to usage, like God, when there's a need, and I want to be the kind of church member that, that, that edifies, that strengthens, that encourages and comforts. So God, when there's a need, I'm going to just follow your Holy Spirit's leading. And if I'm to get involved, I trust that you will give me the gifts necessary to be involved in the right way. And that's a life of faith. And isn't that what we're called to? To live a life of faith. Yes, even in our spiritual gifts. And sometimes I sense, and I hope I can be this transparent with you, I sense we've almost eliminated faith from the whole aspect of spiritual gifts. We've examined it and tested it and figured it out that we've got it so down pat that we've got a, a document and say, okay, I've got this gift. Um, I feel ready now. <laughs> Let me give you an example of this in the New Testament that I think has helped me this week. It may not be an actual spiritual gift, but it gives the principle of just trusting God in the moment of meeting needs. You remember when the apostles were being persecuted and, and Christ was saying, listen, when you come to those hours, don't worry about what you are to say. I will tell you. And this week I was like, God, that's the kind of faith I want to have. That when it's time to speak up for you, or when it's time to act for you, when it's time to get involved for you, I may not know exactly how it's all gonna turn out or what I'm even gonna say or what I'm gonna do, but I wanna take the next first step because I trust you to give me every or any gift I need in that moment. I mean, that's the kind of church that changes a community. So I wanna reinforce again this year after looking at these seven gifts, talking about these three couplets, knowing that this all comes from inside out transformation, which God does when he saves us by his mercy. It all really kind of funnels down to the, the commitment to usage, which starts by meeting obvious needs. And you can do that because you, you trust that God's spirit will sovereignly give you the gifts you need in that moment. And when you do those two things, here's what happens. You will experience spiritual gifts. Notice what I did not say there. I didn't say at that point you could explain your spiritual gift. And you may be able to, hallelujah for that, right? But I'm much more in favor of experiencing a spiritual gift, aren't you? And by the way, Paul told the Corinthian believers, pursue spiritual gifts. His exhortation was, guys, don't be afraid to seek these things, to ask God to use you in this way, to be available for the Holy Spirit to give you whatever gift is needed in the moment so that He's going public so that his power and presence is on display. So those three action points, I hope will help you take five weeks of teaching by myself and Travis and boil them down just a, a, a simple, maybe we'll call it a, a, an equation, a to-do list. I'm not sure what to call it there. But some simple ways to say, you know what? 
I'm just going to start meeting obvious needs because I trust God to give me whatever I need in that moment. And when he does, I'll then look and say, oh, so that's what happened. God gifted me to be exactly what the church needed for that moment. That's kind of the, the essence of acting first and asking later. Remember, action, then analysis. If we will adopt this type of thinking about spiritual gifts, and I will come back next year for the common good three, and we're going to reinforce this again, by the way. But if we as a church could, could get our hands around this type of mindset about spiritual gifts, I think we'd be shocked and surprised at what could happen. Let me give you an example of a story I just heard yesterday. The story itself is decades old. But it showed me yesterday when I first heard it, the power of just trusting God to give you what you need in the moment and then his spirit empowering you. Most of you probably don't know this, that um, my wife had a brother who was killed in a car accident years ago. She was about 13. I think Jeff was maybe 18 or 20 in that range. It was a tragic car crash. He was a passenger his girlfriend was the driver. Her name was Terry. It was decades ago. At Julie's father's funeral a week ago, uh, Terry, who survived the accident, she was the driver, and she's, um, it was, had, it was uh, a devastating accident. So there's her effects on her and results to this day that she deals with. She came to the visitation. I didn't know who she was, but I saw her. And so they started telling me about, well, that's the, uh, Jeff's old girlfriend that she was driving the car. And so that's a conversation about that. It's pretty emotional. It's kind of tense at times. Well, from that, I, I discovered this from my, from my niece. She said that a couple of days, maybe a day even, after the accident, Julie's parents, Phil and Norma, Phil's now in heaven, this is what I heard at the, at the funeral, that they went to the, to the hospital in Toledo to see Terry, who was just fighting for her life, and to see Terry's parents. This is the driver of the car in which the accident occurred that killed their son, Julie's parents. So this is, you can imagine the emotion of this, right? It's pretty tense. They go to the hospital in Toledo. They're about 30 minutes away, and Phil, Julie's dad, says listen, I just want to share and let you know that if you need money to stay in Toledo instead of driving back to Adrian all the time while your daughter's here in the hospital to see if she lives or dies, if you need money, we'll cover your hotel bill. Now, in that moment, that's a massive step. Now, I don't know if that's a gift of giving. I don't know if it's an act of mercy I don't know if it's a gift of helps. I don't know. I'm not here to, to analyze that. I just think it's an incredible, trusting, generous offer when probably your emotion is, I, I don't want to be anywhere near this situation. You're in grief. You're sorrowful. You're mourning. And yet, somewhere in there, he knew that God would give him the strength and the power to serve and minister to this family. And so he did. Now, here's where the story really gets intriguing to me. And you can look back on that and say, wow, that's amazing. But at the visitation is when I heard, and this was confirmed yesterday when I picked Julia up and I asked her niece about it. She said that from, for, the, for however, how many years since then, that when the parents of Terry hear the name Phil Smith, they always say this. They say, now that's a real Christian. I don't know if they took the money for the hotel. I don't know if they got a hotel. I don't know any of those details. I, I, I don't know. But I know this, decades after the accident, there are people who look upon that moment when a man chose to engage, interact with an obvious need in the power of the Spirit and be generous or maybe be exhorting. I don't know what he was, right? Who knows what gift that was? But it has resonated for decades. It's helped the church and has been for the good of God's name in that sense. And to this day, there are at least two people, Terry's parents, who say, oh, when I hear Phil Smith, I think that's 
a real Christian. See, that's the power of spiritual gifts in play in the moment. So I would encourage you, meet obvious needs, trust God to give you the gift you need in the moment, and then experience his distribution of gifts and never underestimate the impact of a spiritual gift sovereignly given in the moment for the good of his people and the glory of his name.